Well, I grew up in uh, the suburbs of Portland, Oregon, a town called Aloha, and spent a lot of my life uh, kind of tinkering, taking some things apart, not always able to put them back together, but always curious. And I, I imagine I got started in astronomy when I saw my first total uh, solar eclipse. And that was in ninth. That was in 1980, and I was 13 years old. And I remember feeling at that moment that I was witnessing something pretty cosmic. And it took a while for me to come full circle to do astronomy as a profession, but that always stayed with me uh, for a long, long time. I assume everyone's in love with astronomy. That's just my default situation, right? I, I assume everybody loves it and is passionate about it. It's just a matter of when you get hooked. And for me, it was that solar eclipse. For other people, it's staring up at the night sky at summer camp, things like that. Yeah, I, I wasn't a stargazer. There are some people who are in astronomy now who made their own telescopes as kids. I was not uh, that, that kid, uh, but I did like the night sky. I remember seeing meteor showers when I was a kid, and that got me quite interested in uh, what was out there, but I was not singularly focused on it. So I remember at one point I convinced myself, as some young kids do, that I would really wanted to do nuclear physics. Like I just went to the library and picked out the hardest looking book that I could find uh, without really caring what was in it. And I was kind of captivated by some of the formulas and the ideas. And so for a while I thought, I am going to study nuclear physics. And, and that didn't really stick because it was not really my cup of tea. It took a long time for me to come around to radio astronomy and uh, in particular in astronomy in general. But when I did, I really found a niche. I felt quite at home in it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I had any high school teachers that helped me. Of course, my well, my father, uh, Nels, was my uh, physics and chemistry teacher in high school. He, he was a teacher at that high school. So he always knew when I had homework to do. Yeah, very, very challenging and, and interesting. But he was a, a really gifted and great teacher. And, um, and he always got me interested in a lot of different topics. One of them was rocketry. So we built a lot of model rockets as a kid and just seeing things go up verifying that they come back down, all very important. Uh, but just building something that could do something was uh, an activity that I started very early. And that did stick with me for many, many years and came has come in hugely useful uh, later in life. And then when I got to uh, college, I was interested in a great many things. And probably the most formative thing I did was after college, I spent a year in Antarctica and I just responded to this ad that said, go to Antarctica, do a bunch of physics experiments. And the, the key thing about that was that there were so many experiments that could be done near the South Pole because that's where the magnetic field of the Earth kind of arcs in and comes down to the Earth. So that's where you get your aurora. That's where cosmic rays can come all the way through the Earth's atmosphere. That's where the solar wind can get funneled into the Earth's atmosphere. So they had a lot of uh, experiments going on down there and I was selected to run like, all of those experiments. And it was like being a kid in a candy store. You just had access to all kinds of equipment, all kinds of science. And that gave me a real appreciation for doing science in challenging circumstances. Well, so, so I'll, I'll tell you, it, it was a hugely exciting endeavor to go down there in the first place and to be in a special place that by its geography lent itself to a certain kind of science. A lot of science you can do in an office with a pad of paper and a pencil, but imagine you have to go to a certain point on the earth to do your science. That's what I learned in that year in Antarctica, how important that was. And getting back to your point on the sweeping, I have learned over the years that it's immensely important to build a team and everybody on the team, the people sweeping, the people analyzing data, the people at the telescopes, everyone plays a role. And that year down there also taught me to get along with many, many different kinds of people. And that has also served me well. Everyone has their own origin story. Everyone has their own emergence into the field. It was the experience in Antarctica for a year that really got me hooked on 
the kinds of experiments that require geography and instrumentation and being in the right place at the right time. And it, it was uh, after I got to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1988 that I started to explore astronomy. And first I did some X-ray astronomy and then ultimately settled in radio astronomy. And and I would just add that you know, for those who uh, want to know more about astronomy, we look at all waves in the electromagnetic spectrum. So the long wavelength waves are radio waves, the kind that you receive in your car. And then they go all the way up through x-rays and optical, and they continue on to very, very high energies. And looking at different wavelengths of light gives you a different view of the universe. And so every different wave band has its superpower because they are sensitive to very particular physical processes out there. So as you dial in to different wavelengths of light, you're looking at different activity in the universe. So it's, it's quite important. And I, I, I focus on radio astronomy, which is very, very rich. They're, they're very interchangeable. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the great example that just absolutely hit me between the eyes. There, there's a galaxy, you know, Her Hercules A. And if you look at it in optical light, it looks like a standard galaxy a clump of stars all emitting a little fuzzy blob on the sky. And you would think that there's nothing strange about it. But when you look at it in the radio, you see directed jets of material that are being sent out from the center of that galaxy opposite to each other. And they travel for over a million light years from the center of the galaxy. These jets of material, these blow torches, of, of cosmic energy span a much larger distance than the galaxy itself. And right away you see in, in one moment that looking at something with different wavelengths gives you an entirely different picture. And, and what's happening there is there's a spinning supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy that is ejecting these oppositely directed jets. And that starts you off on an entire career. It's a great question. The, the, the quest to find black holes in the universe uh, goes way, way back. Of course, you know, Einstein's field equations from general relativity in 1915, and then Schwarzschild's discovery of this mathematical solution to Einstein's equations that admitted an event horizon, a point where light could not escape the gravity of the object that was emitting it. Um, and then a long dry spell until Oppenheimer and Snyder came with their uh, mathematical certainty that matter could condense into a black hole. And then the race was on after that to find these objects in the sky. Optically, you began to see condensations of light at the centers of galaxies, which gave you some hint that there was uh, an extremely dense region in the center. And then people were finding very compact radio sources that were co-spatial with those cusps of optical light. But it was really the high angular resolution radio work, the kind of things that, that I work on now, that nailed it. And the, the, the discovery of these oppositely directed jets you know, all but uh, made it certain that there had to be some kind of a black hole in the center of these, um, of these galaxies. And Ultimately, what has led to these breakthroughs on black holes has been our ability to make the first images of them. And the technique that we use for making those images involves tying together telescopes around the globe. And I found myself at the tops of mountains in the middle of nowhere at high altitude, again, in challenging circumstances. And I felt comfortable there because I had already been at the South Pole. I had already been in Antarctica, and I thought, this is familiar. I, I, th this, th this fits me like a tailored suit. You know, I'm used to making things work in, at 15,000 feet when it's really cold. And, and I, I knew I had found um, the niche for me when everything clicked. <laughs>